Hassani Jamil Campbell was born September 24, 2003 and suffered from cerebral palsy. His mother struggled with addiction and health problems, and Hassani and his baby sister was removed from her custody in 2008 after claims of abuse. They were placed with a foster family for a short time and then placed with their mother's sister, Jennifer Campbell, and her fiancé, Louis Ross. They quickly decided that they wanted to adopt five-year-old Hassani and his one-year-old sister, but taking care of the children became difficult for the couple, and Jennifer soon found out she was pregnant with her first child. On August 10, 2009, at 4.15 p.m., Lewis Ross said he left the child outside in his car in the back parking lot of Shoes, a shoe store on College Avenue in the Rock Ridge District of Oakland, where Jennifer worked as a manager. He said he took one-year-old Aaliyah with him to the front of the store. He claimed that when he returned to the vehicle, Hassani was gone. Due to his cerebral palsy, he wore braces on both feet, and he couldn't have gone very far on his own, but an extensive search for him failed. After five-year-old Hassani was reported missing, police impounded Ross's BMW, took Aaliyah into protective custody, and served search warrants on their home in the 5900 block of Roxy Terrace in Fremont. Lewis took a polygraph test, which he failed, and Jennifer refused to take a test, saying she was pregnant and was worried stress of the test would affect the baby. According to court documents, Ross had also once left the children alone at home while he went to the bank. On July 31st, 10 days before Hassani disappeared, Ross sent an angry text message to Jennifer threatening to abandon him on a Bay Area rapid transit platform. He later stated he had simply been angry at Jennifer and had no real intentions of leaving Hassani anywhere. However, although Lewis was cooperative in the investigation, police were still skeptical of his story. They could not understand how Hassani could vanish in the middle of a busy business district, crowded with people, but nobody see anything unusual, and tracker dogs could not find his scent at the site where he was supposedly last seen. The family's neighbors stated they hadn't seen Hassani since about two weeks before his disappearance was reported. In the investigation, police determined the last time Hassani was seen by anyone other than his foster parents was on August 6 at a Walmart store in Fremont. Two and a half weeks after his disappearance, his foster parents were arrested on suspicion of murder. Authorities intended to charge Lewis with murder and Jennifer as an accessory, but they were released after prosecutors decided there was not enough evidence to file charges against them. Both of them maintained their innocence, but they remained the prime suspects in Hassani's disappearance. In November 2009, after Jennifer gave birth to a daughter, she and Ross ended their relationship and moved out of their Fremont home. As of today, Hassani remains missing and this case remains unsolved. Sir Christopher Clayton Marshall was born September the 11th, 1973, and lived in Carson, California. On the night of July 20th, 1977, the three-year-old stayed the night at the home of Earlene Williams in Compton. It is unclear what Sir Christopher's relationship was to Earlene. 32-year-old Earlene and her children, 12-year-old Ivy Matori, 9-year-old Violet Matori, and 7-year-old Yolanda Williams all lived inside the home in the 300 block of East 131st Street where Sir Christopher was staying the night. Earlene was estranged from her husband, James Williams, at the time, and he was the father of Yolanda. They separated after James was charged with child molestation and rape of his stepdaughter Ivy, and the three girls were supposed to testify against him the next day in court. But at 4.30 a.m., the house caught fire and burned to the ground. Arlene's body was found inside near the front door, and she had been strangled. Strangely, all of the children were missing, and there was a trail of blood leading from the house down an alley where it stopped. This is where the bleeding person apparently got into a car. Authorities determined the fire erupted in the room where all the children slept. James was questioned and released the day after the fire, but arrested for murder the next day when the autopsy results proved Earlene had been a homicide victim. James was allegedly seen with all four children at a Denny's restaurant in Grapevine, California at 5.30 a.m. the day after their house burned down. He was picked up by friends in Riverside, California later that day, but the children were not with him. 
When first questioned, James said he had been driving to Bakersfield, California at the time of the fire, but his car broke down and he had to spend the night in it. One of his hands had a bad cut at the time of his arrest, and he said he had injured it trying to repair his car. In August 1977, James was additionally charged with murdering the four missing children. He was tried twice for murder, but the jury deadlocked both times, and in July 1979, before a third trial could take place, the five murder charges against him were dismissed. I do want to mention that a couple different places I found online said he was eventually convicted for the murder of Erlene, and he has since passed away. Sir Christopher's mother believes he was placed at McLaren Hall Children's Center, a temporary children's shelter in El Monte, California, and then placed in foster care and eventually adopted, but her theory has never been verified. In 2014, Ivy's skeletal remains were found in Corona, California, about 40 miles east of Compton. As of today, the other children have never been located and the case remains unsolved. Andrew Tan Tai Moore was born April 25, 1974, in Vietnam and nicknamed Andy. In 1974, at seven months old, Andy was airlifted out of Vietnam and adopted by Richard and Rita Moore of Lebanon, Pennsylvania. He grew up in the small town with his two older sisters. In high school, he spent summers working and visiting his uncle in California and fell in love with the West Coast. After graduating high school, he left Pennsylvania and moved to San Diego. He worked as a cook at Maloney's Tavern in Gas Lamp Quarter while attending San Diego City College full-time, majoring in international business. On September 12, 2000, Rita asked her brother, Andy's uncle, to go check in on him at his studio apartment at the corner of Ash Street and 8th Avenue in the Cortez Hill area. His parents were worried after being unable to contact him for a few days, which was extremely unusual. When Andy's uncle arrived at his apartment, he looked in the window and immediately called the police. When the authorities forced their way into the home, they found Andy dead from an apparent gunshot and stab wounds. His apartment had been ransacked, and a set of expensive Russell culinary knives and his red 1994 Suzuki Katana motorcycle were missing. The motorcycle was found a month later parked at 24th and C Streets in the 1300 block of the Golden Hill neighborhood on October 17, 2000. The police think the suspect or suspects used the motorcycle for weeks after Andy was killed. Andy's parents mentioned they would not be surprised if someone had taken advantage of their son's trusting nature. His mother stated that he was friendly to everybody and very outgoing. Investigators are eager to talk to the man and two women seen partying with Andy on the last night he was seen alive. Also, the police would like to interview a black man and a white woman seen driving a white compact car, perhaps a Volkswagen Rabbit, near Andy's house on the night of the murder. Police have both DNA and fingerprint evidence from the crime scene and Andy's motorcycle. Catching his killer or killers may depend on whether or not the perpetrator commits another crime, has their information entered into the system, and matches the evidence connected to his murder. Richard and Rita make an annual trip to San Diego to hand out a city college scholarship in their son's name, check on progress of the homicide investigation, and urge anyone with information to come forward. There's a $56,000 reward being offered for information leading to an arrest and conviction in the case, which as of today remains unsolved. Mitchell Dion Owens was born November 21, 1978, and lived in Menlo Park, California with his mother, Aura Owens, and his two brothers. On February 3, 1983, a man broke into the apartment through a window and severely beat Aura. Two of the boys slept through the assault, but four-year-old Mitchell woke up and walked into the room during the incident. Aura screamed at him to run away, and the attacker then attempted to strangle her. While she was unconscious, the man took Mitchell. Neighbors found Aura the next day, and she was taken to the hospital, where she regained consciousness and spent weeks recovering in the hospital. Sadly, Aura only caught a glimpse of her son's abductor, and she believes there could have been more than one person there. 
She believes that one of the men was someone she had met the previous night at the enlisted men's club at Moffett Field Naval Air Station in Mountain View, California. He offered to buy her a drink, but she declined and walked away. She thinks the man followed her home and then drove away when she reached her door. He is described as six foot tall with brown hair, blue eyes, a mustache and tattoos on his arms and was approximately 25 years old in 1983. Another possible suspect is a man who knocked on Aura's door not long before the break-in. He identified himself as a police officer and was in uniform and asked about a report she had made about a stolen purse the month before. However, the Menlo Park Police Department had no record of any of their officers stopping by the Owens home on that date. Aura received telephone calls for years following his disappearance from an unidentified male and the caller repeatedly threatened to abduct her other two sons. Authorities stated that they hoped current forensic technology, which was unavailable in 1983, could help solve Mitchell's abduction and the assault on Aura. She has criticized the police investigation, stating investigators did not look hard enough for Mitchell because the family is African American and poor. Inexplicably, the local police at first listed Mitchell as a runaway juvenile and refused to take action to find him. Mitchell has a scar on the upper portion of his nose and a surgical scar on his left rib area. He also has a lazy right eyelid. Mitchell would be 43 years old in 2021, but he has never been located and the case remains unsolved. Kristen Deborah Modaferi was born June 1, 1979 to Deborah and Robert. When Kristen was 18 years old, she was a design student at North Carolina State University where she was on full scholarship. She had three sisters and is described as being free-spirited, hardworking, and very intelligent. After completing her first year of college in May 1997, she planned to spend the summer in San Francisco studying photography at UC Berkeley. She rented a room in a Victoria home at 274 Jane Avenue, just a few miles from the college and the other occupants were four young men. While there, she worked part-time at the former Spinelli's Coffee Shop, which is now Pete's Coffee and Tea. She also worked part-time at Cafe Muse in the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art. She was scheduled to begin classes at Berkeley on June 24, 1997. But the day before classes began, she asked a co-worker at the coffee shop for directions to Baker Beach. She clocked out for the day at 3 p.m. and was last seen at 3.45 p.m. in the Crocker Galleria with an unidentified blonde woman. The Galleria was located on the third floor of the building and the coffee shop was on the first floor. Her family believes that it may be possible that she and the woman had plans to meet at the Galleria and may have left together. However, the manager of Spinelli's told authorities that Kristen left the building by herself that day. Sadly, she has never been seen again. A bloodhound tracked her scent from there to a nearby bus stop. The bus route would have taken her to Sutro Park Beach, near Land's End Beach. Her scent was also traced there, but was lost near a cliff. Investigators feared that she may have fallen to her death from Land's End Beach, but no one had seen an incident occur and the area was crowded that day. When Kristen's parents learned of her disappearance, they immediately flew to San Francisco to search for her. Police put her case off for one whole week because she was an adult. When the investigation started, they found a circled personal ad in her bedroom trash can that read, Friend seeking female friend to share activities, enjoy music, photography, working out, walks, coffee, or simply enjoying the beach and exploring the Bay Area. However, it is unknown if she placed the ad herself or if she answered the ad. All records from June 1997 have since been destroyed at the newspaper's office. It is also unclear if the ad is even related to her disappearance. Two weeks later, a phone call came into a local news station from a man stating that two women had kidnapped and killed Kristen before placing her body under a wooden bridge near Point Reyes. When police questioned the two women, they said that the caller was most likely John Onuma because he was angry with them because they were planning to fire his girlfriend from the YMCA and he had been harassing them for weeks. John eventually admitted that he made the phone call and lied and just wanted to cause the women trouble. John lived near the Galleria at the time but denied ever meeting Kristen. 
Three other women came forward and claimed that they had incidents involving John and his girlfriend, Jill Lampo. They said that he had abused and tortured them and they were lured in by Jill. Also, they discovered that he often met women through personal ads like the one found at Kristen's place. But Jill had brown hair, so the blonde-haired woman seen with Kristen could not have been Jill unless she was wearing a wig or dyed her hair. When they questioned one of his female victims, she said that he mentioned Kristen in a threat, stating that the same thing that happened to her could happen to you. Finally, when police searched Jill's apartment, they found that her diary had pages ripped out of it and they were written around the same time that Kristen vanished. She said that John had ripped them out, but police never had enough evidence to arrest him. Searches of John's apartment revealed sizable amounts of blood, though it was later determined by DNA testing to be that of a cat. John is a person of interest in the case and moved to Hawaii in 1999, where he was eventually evicted from a $1.4 million home after locals discovered he was possibly involved in Kristen's case. The property manager later found a briefcase in the attic that belonged to John, and inside were several articles about Kristen. In 2015, a cadaver dog with a world-class reputation was brought in by a private investigator hired by her family, and the dog indicated that human remains had been present in the basement of Kristen's house in Oakland. But while the dog had caught the scent of human decomposition chemicals, which can remain in soil for centuries, he could not say if they indicated the remains were that of Kristen or someone else. It was then suggested that Oakland police excavate a poorly finished slab in the basement and take soil samples. In addition, he proposed that the student's roommates be re-interviewed, but the police would not follow up on the finding. In 2017, 20 years after her disappearance, a forensic anthropologist visited the home with a proprietary device that he developed and scanned the area. The device detected human remains in an area between Kristen's home and the home next door at 278 Jane Avenue. Also, a chemical signature that proves the presence of human blood was found at a concrete slab at the bottom of the neighbor's porch steps. The sample matched Kristen's parents' DNA samples, revealing that it likely belonged to Kristen. Turns out, the house was an 11-bedroom halfway house for probation violators at the time. The house had a history of drug raids and dogfighting rings, so needless to say, Kristen was unknowingly living next to a home full of criminals. There has also been speculation that serial killer Robert Durst could be involved with her disappearance as he was in the area at the time. Kristen has the same initials as his wife Kathleen McCormick Durst that he allegedly killed. Another girl with the initials KM went missing in 1997 named Karen Mitchell around the same time as Kristen in Eureka, California. While it's an interesting theory, no other connections to Durst have been made and police do not believe that he is involved. Private investigators hired by her family believe that she was most likely killed in the basement and her body transported elsewhere. However, she has not yet been located and as of today, this case remains unsolved.